shouldn't be here. My presence here wasn't part of anyone's plan. It wasn't part of this congregation's plan to lose their beloved, settled minister, Reverend Schuyler. Yes, he may have been offered a job too good to pass up and broke his contract to serve a year after his sabbatical, but certainly it wasn't part of this congregation's plan to let go of such a fine minister. Jonifer, Reverend Jonifer's abrupt departure wasn't part of this congregation's plan either. He was hired to help the congregation find a new settled minister in two years. His leaving extended that timeline to three years without a settled minister, which was not what this congregation wanted. More important than whether a plan was fulfilled or not, the sense of grief and loss at the departure of these two very fine ministers has been upsetting to members of this congregation. Members and friends quite naturally developed an attachment to these ministers who inspired them on Sunday morning and offered counsel and support when they were in a time of need. They appreciated their leadership in the congregation and outside in the community. As I have spoken the last month to members of Fourth Universalist, I've heard a sense of appreciation of both these ministers and the sadness that they are no longer here or available in the near future due to restrictions on members making contact with former ministers. The unpleasant reality of congregational life is ministers do not stay forever. And sometimes, even when they are great for a time, they can lose their effectiveness or their capacity and strength and stay too long. No minister can serve a congregation forever. And sometimes ministers know when it's time to leave that it's a good time for them to leave before the congregation does. Setting a fixed term for a minister may not be wise either, as the Methodists found out when they moved their ministers after a fixed settlement of four to eight years. Congregations do not remain the same either. The pillars of a congregation grow old, infirm, and die. New bright lights of leadership join the congregation and step up into leadership positions and become new pillars. The times and circumstances of congregations change with the ebb and flow of membership and the world outside these doors. Urban congregations experience more change as younger people flow in and out of the congregation as they establish themselves, their careers, and their families. I've experienced this firsthand in my beloved urban UU congregation in Oakland, California. When I was a member there in the 1980s, I served on their finance committee and knew most of the members. I remember visiting the congregation in the 1990s after moving to Buffalo and feeling a sense of strangeness. I hardly knew anyone. The ministers were the same, but the congregation felt completely different. Ministers change, congregations change, yet emotionally, it is very human to resist it. There is a huge difference when they move. There's the urge to hold on to the past in this world that is constantly changing. The urge for stability in one's church home can be quite strong. 
Sadly, impermanence is a fact of life. With the decline of my father's health and his death in July at the age of 93, I lived intimately with this truth of change, watching his decline over this past year. Having served a congregation on the Gulf Coast of Florida, of mostly retired folk in their 70s and 80s, I saw with great clarity what is likely to be ahead for me. I see the signs already in my body. The Buddha was not shy about describing the reality of sickness and old age, if we are fortunate old age, and the death waiting for all of us. Precious few of us like being reminded of our mortality. I apologize for doing that. Moments like the loss of a minister touches that sore point most of us would rather ignore. So I appreciate the emotional sense that I shouldn't be here. But here I am! I will be your inner minister for the next two years, barring sickness, old age, and death. I have 30 years of experience serving congregations, but inner ministry is new for me. My impulse is to step into the congregation as if I'm your settled minister and to start working on things that I see could be done in the congregation. As I've gotten to know Fourth Universalist, I see lots of potential. I'd love to start developing. Thankfully, from the interim ministry training I've gotten so far, I know that that's not my role. Yes, I'll be offering sermons. Yes, I'll be offering adult education, learning opportunities. Yes, I will be here to offer pastoral care. Yes, I will be supervising your staff. But my key role is to be your coach. I'm here to help you prepare for your next settled minister. One of the most important functions as your coach is to help you recognize, remember, and rediscover who you are as a congregation. You have an identity that is separate from the ministers who have served you, though they may have each nurtured that identity. What are the sources of that identity? Well, number one, your history and heritage. You were formed as a Universalist church in 1838, one of seven Universalist churches here. Now you are the only one left on this island. There are threads of identity that connect this congregation back to that beginning and many broken ones too. This congregation isn't the church of the divine paternity anymore. Our contemporary understanding of Jesus and his disciples departs from the vision of it behind those curtains, beautiful as the artwork is. Yet the universalist vision of the goodness of God and the inherent worth and dignity of every person is having a revival today with the passage of our new Article 2 bylaws that I will be discussing next week. Number two, your location. This congregation is a New York City congregation. It is heavily influenced by its location here on Central Park West and being in the Upper West Side neighborhood. For better, or worse, the congregation has an iconic building that the Landmark Commission wants you to preserve exactly as it is. 
You can't decide to demolish it and build a Louis Kahn building like the Unitarian Church in Rochester, New York, or something along the lines Frank Lloyd Wright might appreciate. Three, the times and society. As a lifelong Unitarian Universalist, I have seen so much growth and development in our congregations. In the 1970s, there were precious few women ministers. Now, a large percentage of our ministers are women. In the 1950s and 60s, humanism was the dominant religious, or rather anti-religious, orientation in our newly merged Unitarian and Universalist Association in 1961. Now, there is much more room for diversity of belief and practice. Religious education has grown and developed from Sunday school to lifelong faith development and learning. Our engagement with social change, while always strong, has learned how to be in coalition with partners to amplify our work. And our work on welcoming diversity continues to grow and develop. Our commitment to non-heteronormative gender expression and sexual orientation, economic, racial, and environmental justice, theological diversity, and global peace, justice, and equity very clearly define us as a congregation and as Unitarian Universalists. This congregation has made statements about its past, about its identity. By being a Unitarian Universalist Association member, it makes a statement about its identity. By formulating and passing mission and vision statements, it has defined itself. Most importantly, the congregation has acted and those actions have brought those statements to life. As your coach, I will be encouraging you to revisit those identity statements and actions. I'll be asking questions. Questions like, these statements and actions are who you said you are. Is this still who you are? Today, if this is who you say you are, how are you currently doing at walking your talk? What might be missing from who you have defined yourselves and what might be obsolete and need to be revised or removed? In the process of seeking a new minister, Identity clarity is very important. In a search process for a new minister, potential candidates will want to know whether their identity is a good fit with the identity of the congregation. Does the congregation's priorities match well with the minister's priorities? The congregation's history matters, the location matters, its commitments expressed in action in this moment matter. The congregation's clarity about its identity matters. This identity review work takes a little bit of time and needs wide involvement by congregational members. Your board and staff have arranged for a workshop to start this process Saturday afternoon, November 9th, in the afternoon. Experienced UUA staff facilitators will be available to help us with this process and the necessary follow-up work as the congregation prepares itself for the search process. The formal search process begins in the March-April timeframe. This is the time the congregation will be discerning who should be on the search team or search committee for your next minister. That process culminates in a slate of candidates for the search team who represent all the different constituencies of the congregation 
and the whole congregation will vote and approve those members. The composition of the search team is extremely important because they will be selecting one and only one ministerial candidate for you to consider. That candidate will be selected in the beginning of April 2026. The candidate will then come for a week, probably in May. They will lead a service at the beginning of the week, spend the week meeting and getting to know as many members as possible and answering their questions and concerns. At the end of the week, they will present a second service. Then, go up those stairs to the minister's office and wait as the congregation votes whether to call them as their next minister. You. If the search committee has done their job well, if they know you well and the kind of minister you are seeking, if they have attracted the candidate that this congregation will want and love, the vote will be overwhelmingly yes. That is what I dearly hope I can help you realize in the coming months. There's another goal for my interim work with you that is much less prosaic and practical. I haven't directly encountered it in the interim training yet, but I know in my bones how important it is. There is a non-specific feeling one gets in a congregation that arises during a Sunday morning service, during the social time after a service, in activities the congregation sponsors or leads, in the religious education program, in meetings and small group activities, it is a kind of spirit. A little like one might experience in a great work group or a book club or maybe a soccer team or a sporting event, but it has a spiritual depth to it. Many Unitarian Universalist ministers name this feeling the spirit of love and life. It is a quality of connection to each other and beyond the self. Some might identify that with a connection with the holy or with God. Others might identify it as secular human quality. The beauty of Unitarian Universalism is that we can appreciate the experience of this spirit and find our own way to name it and understand it. Part of my work with Fourth Universalist is to sense that spirit of life and love here and protect, nourish, and encourage its growth and development in your congregational life. For me, that is the magic sauce. People taste when they come here and come back for more. Each of us have a part to play in protecting, nourishing, and growing that spirit here. I'm so pleased to be here serving you because I already sense that presence here. May it grow stronger during my interim ministry. May it go stronger not just through my contributions, but also through the synergy that happens when the spirit of life and love is present in a congregation, present in each one of us. Together, may we build a bridge from what was to what will be. So be it. Mm -hmm.